Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are back for another Discovery Adventures. I'm Jeff Schroeder, and I will be taking your questions today and leading you through um, with some of these different thoughts you have as we talk with Anna, who is in the museum and will be talking to us about what is an animal? The question on all our minds. Now, as we proceed through this, go ahead and sometimes um, Anna might ask you to participate or send a response. Send those to us in the chat. But if you have a specific question that you would like Anna to answer or one of us, then go ahead and send those through the Q&A function. Now we have guests um, joining us through a couple different avenues and we are broadcasting both via Zoom where we can have some live interaction and also via the uh, YouTube, which might not have that live interaction, but we're glad you're joining us, that you're tuning in and checking out what's going on. So enough talking from me, I'm going to turn it over to Anna and what is an animal? Thank you so much, Jeff. So I am here in the Field Museum in my very favorite exhibit, which is called, What is an Animal? And that is what the whole exhibit is about. It contains all sorts of different types of animals. And so we're gonna have a really good adventure, not only exploring a bunch of animal diversity and also fundamentally, what brings all that diversity together? What are the things all these animals have in common? So to get started, I would love in the chat if you're able to share with me what your favorite animal is. So I can keep those in mind and maybe bring up some of the connections with those animals. So I'd love to hear what your favorite animals are. My favorite animal is a bat, in case you're wondering. You might've seen our bat program a while ago. Oh, and I'm already seeing some oh, yeah. snakes, crocodiles, wonderful. Giraffes. Oh, that's my favorite. I'm seeing dogs and banana. Hmm, is the banana an animal? We will discover. Or maybe there's a type of banana animal, like a banana slug. Oh, cheetah. Cheetahs are very good too. These are some really awesome animals. And I'm already seeing, we're seeing a lot of different, you know, sizes of animals for sure. Some people really like cats or fish. And some people like giant animals like elephants and giraffes. And a banana snake is apparently another type of banana animal. Good to know where all the banana animals are. And some of these animals can move in different ways like falcons who can fly. And some are walking around on the ground like wolves. So there's a lot of different things that these animals have. They're very wonderful and they're very unique. But one thing all these animals have in common and with all the other animals we haven't listed here yet is everybody needs to eat. All sorts of animals eat all sorts of foods, but it's pretty different than other creatures like plants who are able to get their energy from the soil beneath them and from the sun above them. So these are some different animals behind me that the museum has highlighted because they have some really fun different ways to get their food. I'm also curious too, if you want to share any of your favorite foods, we might find some animals that eat some of the foods you like, maybe bananas. And I have another camera with me. So I'm gonna use our little animal cam to get a closer look at some of these different animals. So you may have learned before that animal teeth are a really great clue to figure out the types of food they might eat. So this animal has some pointy teeth compared to this animal, which has those front teeth, which kind of look like a chisel. And then we've got also those flat grinding teeth in the back. Oh, and Anna, we've had some, um, some of our viewers already share that salad, pizza, ice cream, mac and cheese are some of their favorites. That's awesome. So a salad would be a really great food for an animal with these flat grinding teeth, like this rat skull down there. And ice cream is another good food too. I don't know if any of these animals eat ice cream. Someone's and, steak, wow. And pizza or any food that is like kind of thick and meaty, especially if it's a delicious pepperoni or sausage pizza might go well with some pointier teeth like on this carnivore. Now, for a lot of animals, they might eat things that you do not want to eat. One of my favorite things that animals love to eat is dead animals. 
because they're around and they need to get cleaned up by somebody. So there are some animals that act as decomposers. Does anybody run around? If you find like a dead animal outside, do you ever think, wow, that looks delicious. Anybody scoop up roadkill to cook it at home? Some people do. I haven't tried that. And there's also animals like the dung beetle who are able to consume poop and they bring it back for their children. Isn't that so thoughtful? Gotta feed the young ones little poops. Very thoughtful. <laughs> and some animals like wolves or cheetahs that people listed, they're gonna have to work pretty hard to hunt their food. But some animals have some really awesome skills where they're able to let the food come to them. So this animal here is an alligator snapping turtle. And it's got that little red thing in its mouth. Does anybody have a guess as to what that is? You can go ahead and share that. But this animal is similar to an angler fish in that it uses a lure, something that acts like bait to bring the animals right up close to its mouth. What are some things that people think that might be? Can you tell me, Jack? Yeah, so they, someone said bait, a tongue. Um, someone said light. Uh, someone said a red pepper. <laughs> I love the idea of it being uh, a red pepper for all those fish. Okay. Red pepper. A worm lure, someone said, to bring it close to the mouth. Exactly. So it is their tongue. It's part of their tongue, but it is designed to look like a worm. And so it works exactly like fish bait so that the fish will swim right up to its mouth as it is being very still in the water. And the alligator snapping turtle has a wonderful and delicious snack. Everybody is a winner, but mostly the alligator snapping turtle. Another really cool adaptation, if you're not able to get the food to come to you, is to extend your reach to get that food a little closer. So another really cool animal adaptation is of course that chameleon tongue. They can shoot out their tongue super fast. It's got a really sticky end. And so that's gonna attach to that bug right there and then bring it back for a delicious lightning quick snack. So they don't have to be very fast like a cheetah or a wolf to hunt down their prey. They actually move very, very slowly when they're hunting because their tongue is gonna to do that last very fast part for them to get their food. Anna, we had a couple of questions like what about what do animals mostly eat or eat on like a daily or regular basis? And that might even extend to how often do some animals eat, I suppose. That is a great question. So how often animals eat really depends on the animal. Some animals that eat food like blood um, and there's a lot of really tiny bugs. They might be hard to see. And there's a leech over in the jar, and this is a lamprey, but I'm thinking about bats. Vampire bats need to eat pretty much every single day because that food doesn't store very well, doesn't store very well as energy. So they need to eat all the time to be able to survive. And they're actually really good at food sharing. So if a vampire bat can't get a blood meal, they're going to be able to regurgitate into, or if somebody can't get food, they can ask a friend that did get food and they will be able to share that by regurgitating blood into their mouth, which is very cute. Sharing is caring, just a little, little different style of it. But some animals, like animals of a lion or big cat, they don't always need to eat as often, or crocodiles as well. They are going to have really big hearty meals I don't have a big cat here, so we're just looking at a parrot. <laughs> but they're going to be able to have that food last for a while as some energy, if that's helpful to answer that question. Yeah, and that's an awesome close-up view of the parrot. When you move from case to case, can you go just a little bit slower with the, the creature cam so we don't I get sure too easy? I can. Thanks. Make it nice and easy. Parrots, I see somebody's asking what they eat. So you can see the parrot has a really big beak. It's super strong. And so they're um, specialists at breaking open seeds. So they can open Brazil nuts um, or other types of seeds that have a really tough shell and they get into those insides, which is awesome. 
they have like a built-in nutcracker on their face. Oh, cool. Yeah, we're getting lots of questions here, Anna. Um, of course, some people asking about different things that count as animals, like would humans count as animals? And I think probably we'll get to those as we talk more about what animals are. Yeah, well, so far, we know that animals eat and humans also eat because you've all listed some of your very favorite foods, like ice cream and pizza and so on. So, so far, it seems like we are on team animal, but we'll continue to explore. <laughs> Are there any other questions or shall I move on to our next thing? Oh, so let's see. Well, the other question we've got is about animals sleeping and you might get to that eventually. Where do most animals sleep? <laughs> oh, that is a good question. So we can talk about that a little bit for our next segment. I'll try to move nice and gently over here because being safe is really important for animals. And we just talked a lot about eating so another important thing is not being eaten, super important. So for many animals that might involve sleeping somewhere where they're going to be safe and maybe camouflaged or blended in. So this is a fish called a turbot and it's going to rest to recuperate hanging out on the bottom of the water. And you can see its eyeballs are on the side of it. That's kind of unusual for a fish little different than say this kelp bass over there with its eyes on the side of its head, not like both on the same side. <laughs> so camouflage to your environment is a helpful way to blend in and be able to rest. But a lot of animals sleep in different ways. You might see animals in different environments. So this does not live in the water like the fish. It's not blended to those rocks. A lot of insects might be blended to plants where they live. So a moth is gonna sleep maybe on some bark where it's gonna be super blended in and a bird will hopefully not find it and eat it. <laughs> but no. So some other ways that animals don't get eaten that I also wanna share is being very well protected. So some animals have lots of spikes, like this porcupine fish, or an urchin. Because if I was picking an animal to eat, I would definitely not pick the pokiest one. That would be <laughs> a dangerous move. So this is a sea urchin that we're looking at right there. And those are both examples of a type of armored defense so they're not going to be able to be easily eaten. And maybe you've heard of some animals that are toxic, that if you eat them, it might make you sick or at least just not taste good. So one of those would be the monarch butterfly. And those live around here and a lot of places. They're actually going to be starting to migrate up north again soon. So maybe you can see some outside, hopefully, depending on where you are. And they have not only that toxicity that keeps them safe, there's some other animals that mimic that color. So they have the benefit of appearing toxic, but they're not. So next to it is a viceroy. The viceroy is not toxic, but if it looks like an animal that is toxic, it can kind of blend in and animals are like, oh, that looks like it's dangerous, probably shouldn't eat it. Similarly, some animals have a toxin that they can inject, like a bee. So a bee is, I don't know if you, should, I don't know if anybody eats bees. It's probably a tricky thing to eat with those stingers because that stinger can sting you and be very uncomfortable. So we have a bumblebee there on the left, but next to it is a type of moth that looks like a bee, but it is not a bee at all. So again, it's mimicking an animal that has an adaptation to keep it safe. So by looking tough, that's another good way to stay safe. Yeah, and I, we've had some observations from guests too, talking about camouflage, looking like a leaf, but it sounds like they can look like another animal as well. Um, speaking of toxins or poisons, uh, someone was asking if we have jellyfish there. Ooh, we do. So there is a jellyfish right over here. So jellyfish often have um, those little tentacles, which can have stingers 
that can hurt you. And now this is not a real jellyfish. That's sometimes a question. Are the animals real? A lot of the animals are real, but some things like jellyfish or anemones, which is next to it, those are very difficult to preserve in a way that looks so lifelike and beautiful. So these are actually glass models. So an artist made these out of glass based off of the real animals. Wow, those are incredible. And we had another question too about the camouflage. And um, I guess was wondering what in the body helps them camouflage? Is there like something in there they use to camouflage? That is a great question. So let's take a look at some camouflaging animals. For one thing, what happens a lot of the time we see is just evolution. So over time, the animals that happen to be better camouflaged are more likely to survive. If you think about pigeons in the city, for example, um, there's a lot of different colors of pigeons you might see. And if you think about doves, which are the same, but just often called differently because they're all white, maybe you've seen doves released at a wedding, um, they are not very well camouflaged in a lot of environments. So usually if there is a white pigeon um, in the wilds of any city, it's very likely to get eaten compared to a gray or brown pigeon because the white ones stand out a lot. But some animals might have ways, oh, here's one that I like. So this animal kind of carries camouflage with it. So if you ask if it has something inside of it, well, this animal has glue and it's kind of like a crafter. So it's a snail that will use this glue that it makes and glue other shells and rocks from the ocean to its shell so that if it stops moving, it just looks like a pile of stuff on the ground. It does not look like they're there. <laughs> so here is, these are three different snails and they're each covered with different piles of stuff, like all the rocks and bits of old coral and stuff from the ocean that they glued to themselves while they were alive to better camouflage. Oh, cool. Creating its own camouflage. So Anna, I did have another question that came in. This might pertain to something else that animals do as far as having young, but someone was asking if animals kiss or if we have ever seen animals kiss. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I have pigeons at home and they, it looks like they kiss and what they're doing is they're sharing food with each other. Um, <laughs> kind of like a, a parent and baby penguin and that's one thing that comes to mind. Chimpanzees will kiss. Um, and uh, I don't know about other animals, but a lot of animals can express affection in any number of different ways. Like my cat, for example, will like rub her face on me, which feels very nice and thoughtful. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. And every animal is different and there's still more things we're learning about all kinds of animals. So you might find more examples of As we're moving, Anna, someone asked, what would be the most intelligent animal? That's a really <laughs> difficult question to answer. And it depends on how do you define intelligence. So some animals are amazing navigators, but might be really bad at solving a puzzle. There's been studies with chimpanzees where chimpanzees can remember a number pattern that is like longer than what a human can remember. Like they show 10 numbers in a, on a screen for one second humans will be like, oh, I forget where the numbers were, but the chimpanzee can ace it. So there's a lot of different types of intelligence. So it really, it depends on what you consider to be intelligence. That is the question, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, what else can we learn about what makes an animal an animal? Yeah, so the other, another key feature that animals have, so they need to eat. Also not getting eaten is helpful, but that's true for a lot of plants as well. Um, but the other thing that animals, all animals do at some point in their life is they move. They can move around into different environments. And there's a lot of different ways that animals move. So we've got some squirrels up there. And of course, I hope we've all seen some squirrels outside. They're amazing climbers and jumpers. But there's a lot of other ways that animals move too. So let's see. And I can use our creature cam too if that's helpful, but I'll use that in a second. Because we've also got some snakes. I know we had some snake fans. So snakes don't even have legs, but they can still move. 
So they're able to slither along the ground. There's a lot of different strategies animals use. And of course that is helpful for some of the things we already talked about, like getting away from being eaten and also finding food. Moving around, very helpful to achieve your goals as an animal. Let me, I'm gonna use a creature cam now to better see some of these specimens. Okay, so most animals that are on the ground do have legs to move. And sometimes they have a lot of legs, like this millipede here. And even when they're really tiny, like these little skinks, oops, sorry, I'm trying to point at things. <laughs> they do have, still have some wonderful little legs to be able to move around. And even birds that can fly still need a way to be able to rest on the ground. They also have legs. Some legs are specialized for different things, like frogs and these awesome grasshoppers who are able to jump really, really far. They can jump 20 times their body length. So if you can think of how tall you are and then jumping that far 20 times, that's what that grasshopper can do. Wow, <laughs> I could jump over my house. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. And I saw somebody asked how snakes move. So snakes, they are able to move by how they use their muscles. So a snake is pretty much a really long spine, like our backbone you can feel behind your neck, and a bunch of muscles. And the way they move those muscles helps them to slither along the ground. And there's other sliders too, like a snail. They move slowly, but they're still moving around. Mm -hmm. Anna, what's the slowest animal on earth? Do you happen to know we did have that question? Well, so I think that's tricky and that is a good transition to the next thing about moving because some animals don't seem to move at all, right? If, especially you're in the ocean, you might be able to think of some animals that seem stationary. Maybe they don't even seem like animals at all. And so what we're talking about, a lot of it is coral or different sea sponges. So this is a coral over here. So at this stage of its life as an adult, it's actually not gonna move at all. So that makes it pretty slow. It's so slow, it doesn't even move. But with a lot of these creatures, when they're very young and starting out, they are released into the ocean. They're a little baby and they're set free <laughs> adrift in the sea. And that is how they are gonna be moving in their life. They move around, floating with the currents, and then they land somewhere. And if they find enough food and success, they will stay there and continue to grow. So they're very slow as adults because they don't move at all. <laughs> and there's one other thing that animals do I want to talk about. So I'll walk over there, but you can feel free to ask me any questions you are getting, Jeff. Yeah, sure. So we did have a question about um, why do fish panic when they're out of water? <laughs> That's a great question. So there are some exceptions. But in general, animals all need oxygen. And when fish are out of the water, they don't have the, even though there's oxygen in the air, most fish do not have the ability to get that oxygen. So they're very scared because they can't breathe. Just like if you're underwater for too long and can't get out, you would also panic because then you can't breathe. We love breathing. Oxygen is very useful. <laughs> the other thing though that animals are gonna have in common is um, that they can sense their environment. Does everybody remember the senses that we have to perceive our environment? You can throw some in the chat if you want. And animals even have sometimes bonus senses or bonus ways of sensing. So one of the ones that we have, right, is sight. And actually, I'm just going to go over here because that one has a really funny big eye. Look at this great. We've got see, hear, smell, touch. Yep, you've got them. So we see with our eyes, just like this fish, but some animals, in addition to their eyes, and some animals have really funny looking eyes. So this right here is a type of scallop, and you might be able to see all those little dots, those little kind of bluish dots. So they are very basic eyes that are sensitive to movement. So it doesn't see like we do, but if it's like, oh, something's moving here, it can snap itself shut so it can eat it, which is awesome. 
And for smell and taste, some of the other ones you talked about, some animals can smell and taste differently than we do. So if you've ever seen an insect with antennas or maybe touching things a lot with their feet and then rubbing their feet around, the way that our taste and touch, or sorry, our taste and our smell works is there's chemical receptors. They're on our tongue and they're in our nose. For some animals, they have chemical receptors in other places, like on their feet or like on the tentacles of an octopus or in their antennas. So they're able to sense chemicals in the environment in those ways too. An animal we'll probably get to this next if once we talk about some of those really quirky senses. I have gotten several questions about um, animals mating. Do snails mate? Uh, what animals mate other than cats and dogs? Like what all animals mate? Yeah, so that's another like thing about animals is animals are going to reproduce and make young. And for animals, that is generally a team operation. So I mean, here are some slugs which are similar to snails. Um, so this is them mating and they're able to combine all of their reproductive parts. And what's really cool, I think, about a lot of slugs and snails is they all have the same organs. So like all the snails, not, it depends on the species. There's a lot of different types of snails, but for many of them, like two will meet up and then two of them leave and everybody has babies. So like you can end up with a lot of snails it's very egalitarian. And then how you raise your offspring varies in a lot of different animals, but that's important too. So they meet up, they make really cute little baby animals and then they take care of them. So here is a python that is protecting its eggs. Hmm. Were there any other questions about this, Jeff? No, I think that's all we got there other than maybe some specific ones for the end. But I know that we were gonna talk about some really incredible senses, weren't we? Oh, yes. So I'll go back to the senses really fast. Beyond maybe just sight, hearing, smell, touch. <laughs> yeah, so animals have those types of senses. And of course, some of those are like extra specialized for the different animals. Oops, I got it. For example, for bats, Bats have a really amazing hearing because that's a huge part of how they're able to see at night. They make a really high pitched sound. It bounces off of their environment. They hear that and that tells them where everything is. And this is called echolocation because as the echoes are bouncing off of different things, they can locate them. Um, so they have really awesome hearing, much better than we do. But some animals can sense things not just better than us, but just totally differently. So there's a snake right next to me here. And I can use the creature cam. That might be a little better view. Okay. So you can see those little tiny holes on its face. So this is a tree boa and those little holes do heat sensing. So it can actually pick up the heat of other animals and find them and then eat them. And I've actually been to another museum exhibit, it was a Ripley's Believe It or Not, and they showed x-rays from snakes that had eaten electric blankets or light bulbs. Um, so sometimes they sense heat and they're like, aha, it's warm, it must be an animal. And it is not an animal, it is not a good meal. But it's a really cool ability that usually works, especially when you're out in nature. And one of the coolest types of sensing, which I'll go over to really quick, is electrical sensing. So some animals can actually perceive the electric pulse of other creatures around it. And a lot of these are fish, like sharks, for example, have a lateral line where they're able to sense the electric pulses of other animals in the water. Another really cool animal that has this ability is the platypus. Because a platypus, when they're swimming, they go underwater, they close their eyes, they close their nose, they close their ears, so they can't perceive anything other than electricity, but they use that to find their food which is super fancy. I wish I could do that. Yeah. Anna, we did have a question, another question about maybe eating or you know how animals obtain food. How do butterflies eat? Oh, I can show you that. What a great question. Do, 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 do. So butterflies have a long proboscis, 
which is like a bendy straw. And butterflies like to go to flowers a lot of the time because in general, they eat nectar. Um, doo -doo -doo. So it's right up on the wall here. You might be able to see this long line. That is the proboscis. Um, this is from a moth, but they are generally the same as a butterfly. And that will go into the flower to be able to drink the nectar. So it's pretty fancy. Um, and sometimes there are certain species that when they become adults, they don't have a mouth at all. There's some moths that they, they are a very hungry caterpillar. They turn into a cocoon, they turn into a flying adult and they're only gonna live for a week. They don't get to eat ever again. So it depends. There's a lot of different types of butterflies and moths. Hmm. But usually if they eat, they have a long boscus, which is like a bendy straw. How oh, cool, built-in straw. And we've had a lot of questions about what is the biggest and what is the smallest animal on earth? That is a great question. So the very biggest is a blue whale, it, like as far as mass. So they're 110 feet long, they're huge. I don't have one handy because they're humongous. Um, the very smallest, I have to think about that. What is the very smallest animal? Hmm. Has, hmm. Yeah. Would it be, let's see, would it be like some kind of little, are hydras animals or are they quite, mic they're not quite microscopic, so. Like yeah. a tardigrade? Tardigrade or diatom, are diatoms animals? Yeah, probably some tiny little thing floating around in the water, I would guess. Maybe Marcy can figure it out for us. <laughs> yeah, and there are a lot of very small insects as well. So they get very small if you think about, you know, lice or fleas, which we certainly don't like to have around, but they are pretty small, which makes them annoying and hard to get rid of. Yes. And some things like coral, every polyp is really small, but a bunch of them end up clustered together to make a colony. So that's tricky too. So I am getting towards the end. I know we're running low on time. Um, and you can throw any questions at me, Jeff, that are relevant. I did while I'm here. If anyone plays Animal Crossing, this is a model of an oarfish. I just thought it was really cool because I just know it's a very, very big and long fish. But there are, of course, longer things in the ocean, whether they're deep sea worms or the blue whale, or there's jellyfish. They're really long, too. Oh. But I wanted to show the different size of some different animal groups. But are there any other quick questions yeah. before that? Um, Let's see, does every animal have meat? As in like meat, skin, flesh, I think they're asking. Um, kind of, but it's like different. So like a jellyfish, for example, would be very like, I guess meat, but like very gelatinous. And some animals like coral are mostly like inside a hard exoskeleton and the meat part is very, very small. But that's still not negligible. Like even whales, many large whales will eat lots of tiny shrimp, but they eat a ton of it. So that way they have enough energy. Um, but I think most animals have something hard. I can't think of any, or they have something soft. I can't think of any that are like 100% super hard. Okay. And what do we have here? Oh, so the next thing we can see is just the size of different animal groups, because a lot of the animals we think about are like us. So we are animals. <laughs> Hopefully we can see that we have some of those things in common. We sense our environment. We move at points in our life. We move a lot. We move every day usually. And we of course eat other organisms for energy. And we think a lot about cats and dogs as animals, but mammals like us are really a pretty small amount of the group of animals on earth. This is from like, I don't know, this exhibit is at least 10 years old. So it says there were 4,500 mammal species known then. Now there's over 6,000 known mammals. Sponges, there's a lot more. At the time this exhibit was built, there were 9,000 known species. I'm sure there's more now because we're always finding new things. Fishes, this is a lot more. That's like 21,000. And then the next two groups, we have mollusks, which is like clams and snails and um, insects. <laughs> so if you want to see how many of our animals are in these groups, that's where the, the snails stop. 
like way up there. And the insects go all the way to the ceiling and would go 40 feet higher than that. And this was an exhibit that was made at least 10 years ago. So I'm sure we have many more insects since then. So there are a lot of different animals. So not only are insects animals, they are the extremely most common type of, of animal, at least that we're covering today here. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for joining us on our adventure through the animals. Yes. Yeah. Next week is going to be a different sort of discovery adventure, and it will be a bit of an excursion into some outdoor spaces. So definitely tune in if that is something you are interested in. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. Hopefully you'll get a good look at the outdoors. It's called Chicago's Backyard and Marcy will be actually taking us outdoors. Hopefully the weather will be nice and you'll get to get out and see some of the wild spaces around Chicago. Yeah, take care everybody. All right, thanks all, stay curious.